Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living Welcome everyone. Today is Sabbath uh, 11, July 11th, 2020. And uh, I know it's been a while since I have not made a video on Saturday morning. Uh, but we are back at it again. I think last time I was not around. And so I did the first last two times. And so now we're going to continue with our topic of the sanctuary. Uh, well, now what I'm going to do is we are going to <clears throat> we are going to finish the, the series of the sanctuary. Uh, so far we've looked at six parts of the sanctuary. We've looked at the altar of sacrifice which represents uh, repentance we've looked at the bronze laver which is baptism we've looked at the table for showbread which is studying God's word also the candlesticks meaning bringing the light to the world we also, we also looked at the altar of incense which represent the prayers in the Ark of the Covenant that deals with God's commandments. And right now we are going to look at the sanctuary in a nutshell, meaning what can we do we all what does the sanctuary do in a sense for us? What can it show us? And so today's message Today's message is the sanctuary from Genesis to our time. From Genesis to our time. And I'm going to say that a lot of time people, when they talk about the sanctuary, they usually um, begin in the book of Exodus because it plainly shows that how God was leading the, the his people but it is also in the the sanctuary is also in the in Genesis and as a matter of fact this is why we're gonna start with the book of Genesis and let's see what the book of Genesis has to tell us now, before we even start with that um, if you look at your screen, what do you see? Well, you see those are the furniture of the sanctuary. But if you look at the shape of the sanctuary, you see it is the shape of a cross. And so now you can see, I'm sure there are many thoughts coming into your mind as of the shape of it as a cross and yes we will get to that part as well so let us begin with um so if we look at right here we see everything on the outer court is silver and everything on the inside is pure gold now let's actually see what the century is going to teach us in these um in these upcoming slides 
let's look at the antediluvians in Noah's time. So we're going to look at the sanctuary in Noah's time and see what does it teach us. What does it teach us? So the first thing was that, um, let me see. Okay, so the first thing was that God told Noah to build an ark and to make room in the ark. You see, this the ark that Noah built is a representation of the ark of the covenant. The same way, those that were saved were found in the ark, the ark that Noah built. It is the same way in the last days. Those that are saved, they are found in the Ark of the Covenant that God himself made. And so, you're going to see some parallels into the uh, the way it works. The second thing, God, of course, made a covenant with Noah. And when God makes a covenant with somebody, it means he, he puts you, he sets you aside for a different type of um, work. Next thing, we know that Noah preached the message. It was a judgment message and Noah preached it for 120 years. And so, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And the fourth one is God's long suffering towards the antediluvian. And so God bore with them a hundred and twenty years before he allowed the flood to come. And yes, what we're looking at right now is we're looking at how the, the sanctuary is being played out throughout the time of the antediluvians. And we're going to see how it's been played out throughout the time of this planet Earth. Not to mention, let me mention that part too. The first place that the sanctuary message was being preached was in Eden. As soon as men sinned, God showed them what he had to do. They had, he had to kill a lamb. That's the altar of sacrifice them so you get the idea of the sanctuary as we get further down and then of course then the flood came and the flood here symbolizes innocent baptism or labor meaning purifying the earth you see so far we've been looking at each of the cut of the furniture of the sanctuary the ark of the covenant represent the ark of noah the second thing is the covenant that God made with Noah represents the, the candlesticks. And then and the, the message that Noah had to preach, which is the temple for showbread. Then four, God bearing patience with, with them is he's interceding on their behalf in a sense, which is out of incense. But of course, the flood came and that was to purify uh, the earth and lastly Noah built an altar an altar and offers a burnt offerings for God so here in the book of Genesis we see we see the sanctuary being played out and this is just the book of Genesis that's not even the whole book, not just the part of the flood type um, part. I'm sure there's other ones too. If you look at Abraham, you're going to see it as well over there. You know? And so, but right now we're looking at the antediluvian. And so this is part of it. Now, let's move on to the book of Exodus. God is now leading the Israelites 
out of bondage? Well, the first thing that they had to do was to kill a lamb. Hence, the term Passover is created. And so, the Passover, Exodus chapter twelve, that's where it's come. That's where it came from, the Passover. Then, after they killed the lamb, which is the outer sacrifice, God took them out of Egypt, and the next thing they was they were faced with was the Red Sea. Interesting. Now, do you see the path of the sanctuary? This is why, this is why, in Psalm 77, verse 13, the Bible says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. And here you can see the path of the sanctuary from the altar of sacrifice, the king of the Lamb, next to the Red Sea, which is baptism. As a matter of fact, they received two baptisms at the Red Sea. The fire baptism, when God separated them from the from the Egyptians with the pillar of fire, and on the water baptism when they went through the Red Sea. Next thing, He brought down manna. The next thing God did was He brought down manna. He changed their diet. So, your diet has something to do with. How you worship God as well. Then he, he tells them, Okay, I'm gonna make a covenant with you guys. If you're gonna keep my covenant and observe my statutes, and you will be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Yes, this is the seven branches candlestick. And so throughout God leading them out, they've been using the sanctuary so they can, so they can, uh, so we can understand how he works with us. And of course, um, he says, get ready and look at yourself. Be ready because I'm going to come down on the third day. And when God says to get ready, it basically means look at yourself. Are you clean? To receive me. Meditate upon that. And then. Chapter 20 of Exodus. The Ten Commandments. So. Right now what we are, what we are seeing. Is the sanctuary. In action. The sanctuary. In action. Yes. The sanctuary. In action. Now let's move to the next one. How about Jesus coming down from heaven? Huh. I wonder what, what would it be like? What would the sanctuary show us with Jesus coming down from heaven? Well, let's see. We have... We have... He comes down from heaven. The next thing is... He lived a life of prayer. Alright. Then he let his shine his light shine. He lets his light shine. He lived off of the bread of, of the word of God. He was baptized. And finally, he was crucified. And this is him coming from heaven. You see, each step of the sanctuary is reflected in Christ's way of living on this earth. Now, how about his life? Well, where was he born? He was born among animals, meaning he was born to be a sacrifice because the Sacrifice animals. Right? Then he was baptized. 
Now here's the here's the most interesting part. What do you think will be the next three major event in Jesus Christ's life after baptism? Didn't Satan come to him and tempted him to turn the stone into bread? I wonder why you call why why bread? Why not um yam or potato or mm, something else why bread well don't forget satan also knows the message of the sanctuary then the next thing is satan tempted him to offer a presumptuous prayer cast yourself down for it is written yeah the devil also know the bible better than we do and the next thing is okay you know what here it is i know you came to save your church but if you bow down to me you can you can shine as many lights as you want as long as you bow down to me here i'm going to show you the glories of the world and so yes and then he, after he overcame those temptations, he went on to preach the law of God with the mercy of God, meaning the time is fulfilled, repent. Now, let's move on. How about the Jews rejecting Jesus Christ? Yes, the Jews actually rejected Jesus Christ. Let's see. So first thing, they rejected the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Then they also rejected the water of life. Of course, they also rejected the bread of life, you know. And they rejected the light of the world. They comprehended it not. Because they really preferred darkness over light. And they also rejected his prayer of forgiveness. And we're going to get to that part to that prayer of forgiveness and of course they rejected the law because Jesus was the law himself now how about that at the cross uh, and that one is just I guess just to add to it but it probably doesn't have to be exactly that he was nailed in the, in the feet right he was now on his right hand on his left hand they put a crown of thorn upon his head. He died from a broken heart. Remember when it's not like his heart was actually broken, something like that, but when he prayed for their forgiveness, they rejected that prayer. And that hurt him even more than all the whipping, all the whooping he was getting, in a sense. And remember what happened? Um, Remember what happened after he died? Well, they pierced his side. And what came out of his side? Blood and water. Huh, water. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Blood and water. Now, we have a lot to go actually. Let's go to the next one. And I'm hoping by this time you are seeing why the sanctuary is very crucial and pertinent to understand even in these last days. How about Jesus going back to heaven? Well, if he used the sanctuary to go to come to earth, then he's going to use the sanctuary to go back to heaven. Well, let's see. First of all, he was crucified, right? Yes, he was crucified. Then he was resurrected and purified. What else? He ascended to give manna from heaven. Because he was the manna, actually. So he ascended to give manna. He, John sees him ministering among the candlesticks. 
and now uh, and some of them I give you the some of them you already know the books the chapters and some of them I give you the reference for that and of course you send it to intercede not just that one but also Romans chapter 8 verse 34 gives us that part that he went to intercede and of course the judgment begins for the ark of the covenant so that this is the this is the sanctuary message if you didn't know the sanctuary message was that potent i hope after this time you see how important it is to know this message of the sanctuary now let's look at jesus himself he is the lamb of god that's what john said he is the water of life that's what he told the one of the world he is also the bread of life he is the light of the world he is our intercessor now we have a great high priest in heaven it's in uh, hebrews chapter 9 it's also found in uh in second peter chapter 1 no second first john chapter 2 my bad verse 1 and all the places too and of course here in John chapter 8 verse 12 and he is the law personified why is he the law personified? because he kept the law and he never um, failed in one point he was tempted as we are yet without sin now that one i found out recently did you know that the 70 weeks is also of Daniel chapter 9 is also part of that message hmm let's talk about it let's see we're going to look at the last week, the 70th week of the prophecy. Let's see how it started. Nope, that's not how it started. The first thing, and I'm going to give you that way. The first thing, he was baptized here. You can see in Luke in the number one baptism. That was in AD twenty seven. That's the first thing of the seventieth week because actually Daniel chapter nine tells us that uh, the beginning of the seventieth of the last week would be when the Messiah comes. So when it says. Uh, from the going forth to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince is 69 weeks so at the end of that 69 weeks which is basically the beginning of the 70th week the Messiah comes and how do you know he came exactly right now Acts chapter 10 tells us that he became the Messiah when he was baptized so that's when the 70 weeks started second thing he did was he instituted the lord the lord's supper or the last supper we call now we call that communion that's the table for showbread the next big thing he did was he was crucified so first baptized second thing he did was he instituted the communion that we do nowadays and third thing he did was he was crucified the fourth thing is he ascended to intercede for us and he said i'm gonna go to the father but i'm gonna send you the comforter and the fifth thing was the holy spirit comes down as tongue of fire which is the candlesticks and of course at the end of it they rejected the message and they stoned stephen and that is called the judgment when jesus christ stands it is judgment time and this is the 70th week 
of the seven week prophecy. So, how about the New Testament? How is the New Testament written? You guessed it. You guessed it. Sanctuary message. Let's see. Could it be true? Let's see. Well, what is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about? It's about the life, death, resurrection of Christ, which basically means the sacrifice of Christ. The altar of sacrifice. The book of Acts. <laughs> the book of Acts. Well, the book of Acts is all about baptism. It's baptism. Now, from Romans to Jude. From Romans to Jude. It, 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 it is from Romans to Jude. It's studying God's word, witnessing, and interceding. And I could say especially for interceding, especially Hebrews. Yes, from Romans to Jude, it's those three things. Word of God, the candlestick, and the art of the incense. And of course, Revelation is where you get to the throne room of God. I'm, I'm hoping you're excited by now. Let's see one more. Now, how about... Now we're looking at prophecy again. And this is much further prophecy. The beast described in the book of Daniel. Well, we know that he would make the daily sacrifice void. We know that it invented infant baptism. We also know that it would cast down the truth of the word of God to the ground. We also know that he would wear out the saints of the Most High, meaning they couldn't preach the message, of course, and he would war against them. We also know that he would show himself to be God. And I'm going to mention what, what I mean in the future one. And of course, we know that he would think to change times and laws. Now, what is this beast? And this is not to hate on other people, but this is just the truth about it. That beast is the papacy. And I'm not talking about Catholic people. I'm talking about the Vatican. That's the Catholic system. The papacy. Not the people. The papacy. The system. And so... And so... The first thing it did was it replaced it re excuse me it replaced the sacrifice of Christ by penance or you had and you had to beat yourself to receive forgiveness. The next thing we do we did it was it replaced the baptism of Christ which is immersion by infant sprinkling. The third thing that it did was it cast down God's word and replaced it by church traditions. The fourth thing he did was the light of the church was cast down because only the priest could interpret the Bible and nobody else could have a Bible in their hand but the priest. And of course, Jesus' mediation was cast down and now replaced by confession of both. And of course, when you put yourself in the place of God, you have to be moved out of the picture. And remember, Jesus is our interceder, intercessor before the Father. And now, they remove Jesus and they put a man 
in the place of Jesus who is God himself. And that's why I was shown that he is God. And of course, the law of God was cast down, replaced by Sunday worship. I should have put Sunday worship as well. But of course, it. But of course, I can always do that. It it replaced it with Sunday worship. Let's see if I can do it now. Sunday worship. Okay. How about Jesus and the book of Revelation? And I'm going to make that very short. I'm not going to try to make it long because it's not supposed to be long. Well, in Revelation, we see Jesus takes the scroll. The lamb that was slain takes the scroll. We also see a multitude from the great tribulation and it says that the lamb was leading them towards the, the fountains of water and again he was feeding them with the bread of heaven and you see a vision of Jesus Christ in the, se in the midst of the seventh lamp stand. Of course, who is praying worthy is the lamb that was slain. That is the people singing and praying, praising God. And of course, God's room in heaven was open. But, now, let's talk about the Reformation. Because yes, the Reformation is also part of that sanctuary message. In the 1300s, there's a Catholic monk or priest by the name of John Wycliffe. He saw that the people did not have God's word with them. And let me come back real quick.
Okay. I had to take care of a few things. Um, very right. Let's see. So, we were looking at the RPS okay, yes, in the 1300s. In 1300s, there's a man whose name is John Wycliffe. And, uh, and that man came and that man came and saw that the people were not actually did not have a Bible and he said we need to have them a Bible and then he gave, and then what he did was he translated the Bible from Latin to English and that's where we get the term the KJV King James Version comes from that and by doing that, he effectively restored the table for showbread. Now, why? Oh, I am bringing this because there is a message in the sanctuary that is called "Unto two thousand three hundred days." then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And that's found in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. And the cleansing was coming through the Reformation. And when he did that, he effectively restored the table for showbread. Well, next we had Martin Luther. And Martin Luther came upon the scene. Let me put that a bit up. Martin Luther came upon the scene. When Martin Luther came upon the scene, he saw that the people were actually giving penance and walking and beating themselves. And he said, wait a minute. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, The just shall live by faith. What he did was, he just went and got up and started to preach that the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient enough to for the remission of the sins. Then we have John Calvin. John Calvin came, and actually when Luther did that, he effectively restored the altar of sacrifice. And John Calvin came in the 1500s and he said, we need to go and preach to the world, not just the priest, but everyone needs to be preaching to the world. And by doing that, he effectively restored the seven branch candlestick. And then, in the 1600s, we have John Smith or William Rogers, either one of them. More likely William Rogers uh, and John Smith also was the um, Anabaptist and Rogers was the Baptist. So they are both in the same category. So Anabaptist and Baptist, same category. I think one just came be earlier and one came after. And so while he was, as when he was he was looking at um, actually Melanchthon. No, Menos Menos Siemens is the one for the Anabaptist. Menos Siemens first saw that somebody was being decapitated because he was baptized, and so he went to study and found out that infant baptism is not biblical. But then he was also William Wheeler's Roger, Roger William came and started to preach it more fervently and both started to accept that uh, the baptism by immersion and by doing that he effectively restored the la the, the, the bronze labor. And then John Wesley's, the Wesley's, in the 1700s, they, they, they realized that we already have a high priest in heaven. Why do we have to go to a man to confess our sins? If Jesus is our high priest, we need to go to him. And so when, when they started to preach that, and by doing this, they effectively restored the altar of incense. 
and of course at the end of that 2300 day prophecy God raised a movement God raised a movement in 1844 October 22nd 1844 at the end of that 2200 day prophecy God raised a movement the seventh day Adventist movement actually we said the preaching the law of God including the Sabbath commandment which is today by the way not tomorrow but today and if you are a Seventh-day Adventist basically you are a uh, a mixture of Anglicans because we believe everybody should have a Bible in their hand we also Lutheran because we believe only Christ the Christ is enough we are also Presbyterians because we believe that everyone should go and preach the message we are also Baptist or Anabaptist because we believe in the baptism by immersion and we also Methodist because only Christ is our mediator and we are basically all of these combined in the melting pot but we keep the seventh day Sabbath so if you didn't know what you are as a seventh day Adventist let this message of the sanctuary tell you what you are as a seventh day Adventist now how about a genuine Christian well they will accept the sacrifice of Christ they will be baptized they will eat the word of God they will also let their light shine they will also live a life of prayer and they will keep God's commandment but of course Satan always has to put a fight because the sanctuary is under attack again how so now people are not willing to have that bitter experience they want to skip around the altar of sacrifice so they can jump into the liver without repentance they want to be baptized in the platform of believing in jesus christ even though they are living in sin and many of our pastors are doing that people would just say they believe in christ okay they baptize you because they want to get more members that's a recipe for failure and they also believe that now certain Israeli people believe that the Bible does not settle every question and that part of the Bible should be removed yes the sanctuary message is under attack again for one last time and this time it will be the last one now religious freedom being restricted you can't preach in some countries if you preach they're gonna kill you I guess if you are not uh, uh, it's particular in a particular denomination and people will say now that prayer doesn't help when it comes to life changing uh, which is a false accusation against God in a sense and of course they are urging nations to enforce Sunday to combat climate change um, so you can see that what's going on with the sanctuary right now it is being attacked again and again and again and uh, that's and just to show you why that is I'm gonna give you some of those headlines uh, 
the three voices that's that's um the word of god being under attack when he was preaching babylon has fallen when the bible says babylon is fallen so mixed message right here and of course that's why i was i said right now here where he says babylon has when actually the bible says babylon is fallen but he's giving a different version of his gospel not god's gospel of course worldwide restriction religious freedom restriction on the rise and we can look at the map to see exactly where that is we see most countries on the on the western part is on the eastern part you basically cannot preach anymore because because um they don't want you to convert people to for to get to follow christ anymore and that was out of december 2015 and so and of course hate in god's name um they said they said that religious extremism and relation to violent conflict and they mentioned something about what you cannot do what actually is constitute what constitute um what constitute hate and they said right here that in cases of sin, like here are the things that that here are the things that they called religious extremism and they call they call this right here religious extremism which is preaching about end times prophecy end time prophecy millennialism and the belief that the second coming of jesus christ was imminent this is actually those are illegal activities basically they call that extremism so people like me who preach that jesus christ is coming soon i am basically an extremist i am basically an extremist and you can read for yourself that's why i put the that's why i put the title of it so you can see it is from the southern poverty law center hate in god's name and of course this guy here is trying to teach his people to pray to the holy spirit which is not what God says in his word. Let's take a listen. Spirit came and brought power. If I could change one thing of the church today, it would get us reconnected to the Holy Spirit and his power. When's the last time you prayed, dear Jesus? Oh, probably today. When's the last time you said, our Father? Eh, within a day. When's the last time you said, dear Holy Spirit? I've got a prayer for you today. I know you're the one that's working on this earth right now. I know you're the one in control. I know you're the one bringing power, bringing knowledge, bringing wisdom, bringing comfort, bringing peace. I know you're the one that's right here, interactive with us right now. You are God, God the Spirit. I want to talk to you right now because there's something I need to have done right here in my in my own life, in my own community. I, I need to partner with you on this. When's the last time you said, dear Holy Spirit, and said a prayer? If we could change one thing about the church today, I would get us reconnected with the Spirit and His power. I think it's unfortunate that the devil has used this tactic to try to downplay the Holy Spirit so much that there are actually people within our church today who are afraid of connecting the Holy Spirit with our church. They are fearful. They're fearful of terms like spiritual formation, and I, I don't have a problem with any term because I know God. God's not afraid of any term. God's not worried about any term. He can defend himself. When, when I need to form uh, my life into a, a stronger being, I need spiritual formation. I need, I need the spirit to truly form me into who he needs to be. When people are afraid of contemplative prayer, I tell them, hey, I always contemplate when I pray. I contemplate how great he is and how small I am. We need to, we need to forget all these terms and all these things. The tactics of the devil are in the church because he hates what we're doing. 
if we could change one thing about the church today is that would help us to connect with the Holy Spirit. So, I hope you heard that. Yes, he was saying that. And if you don't know what um, spiritual formation is and contemplative prayer, go find out. you see how demonic it is. And of course, um, and of course, we have urging all nations to enforce Sundays. And those are the headlines. And so I'm not making those up. Of course, for me, it's in, for me, it's a book called La Da To See. Um, for me, it's a book called La Da To See. He is, in fact, trying to get people on the, the nations to enforce Sunday to combat climate change and take care of the poor, whatever. And so, and of course, many countries are now... Um, putting that into display and I don't think I need to to say more on that I just I just um, well that was actually clear actually so but I'll just give you some topics so you can look at it and so that's it, friends. Uh, so that's it for today. We were looking at the sanctuary from Genesis to our time and seeing how it actually uh, how it actually works uh, for us. And so I hope you understand. I hope you learned something new. I hope you see how important the sanctuary message is and how it can open your eyes to the into the Bible. So today was July 11th, 2020. Um, it is Sabbath. It is Sabbath. And I hope to see you again on Monday. Um, if I don't see you on Monday, I hope to see you again when Jesus Christ comes the second time. Until then, bye for now.